Hello, and welcome to episode 419 of the Crate and Crowbar Gaming Podcast, being recorded on the 31st of May 2023. I'm Marsh Davis, and this evening I'm joined by Jamie Britton. Hello. Jamie, there's loads of games coming out. There really are. How do you feel about that? I feel tempted, is, is the word I would use. Like, these are all games that are not really in the kind of pocket of generally. So there's like Diablo 4 about to come out, mm. uh, Street Fighter 6 uh, yeah. about to come out as well. Um, there's another big one that my brain... Oh, Final Fantasy 4... Uh, sorry, 14, Final Fantasy 16 is about to come out. Mm. There is the new Amnesia game, which I think looks absolutely fucking fantastic, about to come out in a few days too. This is the uh, like World War One era one where you're in a bunker and you're running out of power, and it looks absolutely oh. terrifying. It looks fantastic. I, I would heartily suggest watching some of the, uh, the uh, clips of that that are on YouTube because it looks like proper immersive sim horror experience game. Um, mm. So there's that too, uh, as well as Zelda having just come out as well. I would like to play all of these games, but they all some of them cost seventy pounds. Oh, good and lord. If, if you buy the super uber best value version of Diablo 4, it says on their website, it's the best value. You can buy three copies, right? You can buy the normal one. You can buy the one that gives you like four days early access and a whole bunch of like cosmetic gubbins. And then you can get the like super duper one, which is like a hundred pounds plus. And that's the best value, they say. They say it there on the website. So it must be the best value. It doesn't know what the best <laughs> value is for their products. Um, anyway, I just want them all. But yeah, they're all very expensive, so I can probably have none of them at present <laughs> in my present state um, because it's already been a kind of big year for full price games. But I just kind of wanted oh. to recognise that on that that this moment has happened on this podcast where there are too many <laughs> well, has, yeah. excellent looking games all arriving at once. <laughs> it has been a, a quiet couple of years, really, uh, since the pandemic, I suppose, for for big launches. It does feel like all of the games are coming out at once. But, you know, happily, none of these things will, will go off. Uh, <laughs> I mean, well, that's not true, is it? Because Diablo being a, a live service game, that will presumably change in fundamental ways across the course of its life. And, you know, as with many live service games, perhaps become defunct in ways which are unpredictable. But, you know, Street Fighter Six will still be there until they make Street Fighter Seven. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it is funny that when you see the some of the earlier reviews of Diablo 4 that I'm seeing, and almost all of them contain a variation on the phrase, well, it's definitely a live service game. <laughs> and yeah. it's like, do you mean it's sort of tedious and shit? <laughs> and that sort of detracts from something, you know, that you would otherwise love. <laughs> that does seem to be the trade-off that everybody's expressing. Like, yeah. Literally in every single sort of like uh, stand first or, or uh, subtitle for a review, yeah. it's like the microtransactions get a... A nod. Not a nice nod. A bad nod, Jamie. Yeah, a frustrated nod from the, the video game critics and YouTube personalities of 2023. Do you generally find yourself drawn to playing something in the first sort of flush of its life, or, or are you kind of able to sit back and let the uh, the opinions roll in and, and take your time with uh, releases? Yeah, I don't know, because I am such a creature of impulse. I am so drawn to, like, flashy lights literally like flashy lights like that street fighter 6 has got some really cool flashy lights when you do your special moves and whenever i see footage of it i just want it you know and it's very hard for me to take a step back and think you know do you actually want this do you need this at all will you play it for more than five hours <laughs> you know in total across your lifetime probably not you know um but it just i think you know by their nature video games they do speak to kind of they show us kind of the flashy lights and colors and sounds that we can't help that we're sort of mm. evolutionarily sort of programmed to respond to. And then they kind of, you know, do you want to have a go on this? <laughs> is the kind of thing that they say. And mm. I find that very, very hard to resist. I wish I could be a guy who's just like, no, I'm just going to play this deeply serene, traditional, you know, indie life sim uh, <laughs> for another 400 hours before I crack open Zelda. You know, I, you know, I, I love games like that, but I do find it, very, very hard to resist the shiny shinies. Yeah, it's kind of, I guess this is something that we've been missing to some extent. Is the I mean, the idea of kind of defined launch windows as they used to exist during the, the, the days of my games journalism 
don't really happen anymore in the same way because releases are so fragmentary. They, 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 some of them, you know, are early access for long periods of time. It feels like there's no, there's not the same kind of impetus to rush to uh, a, a game now in the same way that it used to be. No, Do you think that's true. Uh- or at least there is. That's true for fewer games, maybe. I and think it's the, fewer. Those games yeah. don't tend to come out necessarily at the same time, and it makes it particularly kind of yeah attractive when they do. And I think all of the games mm. that are releasing at the moment, and Zelda included, they all have like um, even like you know people talking about the jankiness of, of Diablo Four. They all have like insane levels of polish, just like mm. sky high. I mean, Zelda. It feels like that's all they did for about a third of the production on that game is just polish and polish. You know, because it's so. Uh, sort of pristine in its presentation. Um, and I just, you know, I, I was saying this a while back when I was talking about uh, Dwarf Fortress with graph- graphics, you know, we all like to think of ourselves as like, oh no, I'm just I'm just pure maths really, me. That's all I care about <laughs> in my games. But actually, I, I really think that it's very hard not to find that stuff um, super exciting. I also think mm. we've kind of gone through a long phase where games plateaued in terms of how they looked. Um and I think we're possibly now seeing the kind of reckoning with that in games and then sort of trying trying out different stuff in terms of how they, you know, push push visual design in ways that isn't just like realism, um, you know, kind of going for a, t- a different tack on that. And I think that has something to do with it too. Like games are starting oh, yeah. to look impressive I'm seeing a lot, again. A lot of games making use of uh, the Unreal Engine's fluid dynamics stuff that was... Uh, I remember being excited about seeing in in tech demos, I don't know, three, four years ago. I can't remember exactly when it debuted, but, you know, there were all these delicious liquids sloshing back and forth and, you know, lots of uh, particles, more than you could count, bounding around the screen. And now we're seeing that in a lot of games. It's just kind of like throwaway effects. Like in um, the Star Wars Jedi game, there's like some poorly explained uh, (laughs) nanite cloud in fact, it's it's never really you don't really find out about it at all what what it is or why it's there. It just exists as sort of area denial thing that'll eat you if you go in, you know walk into the wrong areas of the map. Yeah, and then it, it's sort of passed over and you you don't really see it again. Um, but I mean, obviously, that's powered by simply the desire to use that plugin. <laughs> <laughs> it's the only reason it exists. Um, Absolutely, yeah. I mean, there was a Sony uh, showcase uh, last week or so ago um, where they had a bunch of kind of uh, uh, trailers for things, most of which I was kind of a little bit mad on. Um, uh, the two that really made me sit up was the one for um, Bungie's uh, new take on Marathon, um, which uh, I just thought was a very, very beautiful, uh, beautifully designed and stylish trailer, which seemingly did about a thousand things at once, but didn't feel didn't feel like it. it felt cohesive and interesting and i think it was surrounded by a whole bunch of kind of cyberpunky nonsense trailers so it kind of dragged it down a bit but i actually thought um from a design standpoint which is a subject i know nothing about but from to my idiot eye it was very um very impressive and unusual and good and i think if there's one thing bungie are good at it's art direction um so yeah i was, I was excited by that one and also the idea of a marathon game like lots of lots of the chat online was like, oh no, it's a looter shooter. But I was like, ooh, marathon but a looter shooter. That's kind of that's kind of insane. <laughs> Might be interesting. And then they also showed the trailer for the new um, for Spider Man Two, which I just thought was one of the most spectacular gameplay trailers I think I've ever seen. Um, just wonderful stuff, really. So, um, and yeah, and that was full of all the new Unreal, uh, you know, tricks and mm. whatnot. So yeah, it's kind of exciting time in AAA. I think at the moment. If, if it's what you're into, and I'm, I guess what I'm saying is I can't help but be into it, um, <laughs> uh, I think it's uh, I think it's going to be an exciting couple of years. Even one of the games I've been playing this this week has a has a sort of an ostentatious uh, use of fluids. Um, in fact, have you seen any? Have you seen any of Humanity? I played the demo of it and was oh, you did? Uh, okay. and was completely knocked out by it. Actually, I thought it looked amazing. <laughs> I was uh, I'm very interested to hear what your take on it is. Actually, because I love the demo. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, I mean, it's a it's sort of um, a Lemmings like puzzle game about directing huge crowds of of idiots um, through hazards um, by dropping instructions like turn left or jump where necessary, um, and also you're a glowing 
Shibuitsu. Is that how you pronounce the dog name? I believe Shibu- so, yes. Shibuitsu? Anyway, uh, which is wacky. I haven't actually decided if that's like a piquant sort of refreshing style of wacky or whether it's uh, the kind of wacky that has a sign over its desk saying you don't need to be mad to work here, but it helps in Comic Sans. Um, so I, I'm i torn. I, I do like the art direction, uh, like which has very, uh, what's the word, brutalist almost, um, bare bones style to some of the environments, which are these, just these huge monolithic concrete blocks suspended in the sky. And then there's quite a contrast between that and the way it depicts the, the people that you're guiding, who are this sort of Uniqlo dressed technicolor <laughs> column of flat textured mannequins um and then it's Uni- got this uniqlo is bang on there <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah even even the, the music sort of has a bit of a sort of i don't know it's all of a little thing it's if I, I, I like the music it's got this kind of kooky electro soundtrack that sort of but it's sort of it install radio of, yeah <laughs> well it reminds me of i don't know uh, the um the guy who um scored uh utopia and um the White Lotus, a guy called Cristobal Tapia de Villa, who, uh, who makes use of lots of kind of synthesized voices and sampled voices. And this has like lots of synthesized voices saying, ah, in different pitches. Um, and, and it's kind of weird and offbeat and cool. Or is it just annoying? I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, that, but the, the the game kind of wows you with just the sheer number of bodies that are on screen at the same time, and the column of humans that it, you're you're chaperoning around has the sort of the energy of water to it uh, in the way that when you make them jump, it's almost like a spray from a hose of all these bodies flying through the air, um, and I think it relies quite a lot on how uh, stunning and uh, strange that looks i've say so far the puzzles are fine <laughs> um <laughs> yeah I, they do escalate uh in odd ways like i don't think they become uh, there's no kind of like revelatory mechanic that it drops on you that shifts your perspective in a, in a, an exciting way which is sort of what i what i hope for from puzzle games but they do do weird things. Like at later stages, they equip your column of humans with lightsabers and you <laughs> plow into other columns of enemy lightsaber wheeling dudes and you slaughter each other, um, which is which is just strange. Like it, uh, you wouldn't have thought, thought that was the direction this game would escalate in, but it does. Um, but I haven't yes. found a, a point in the game where it's, it's introduced... Uh, uh, a trick to me that's maybe go wow that's so clever it's usually oh well that's kind of cool or that looks <laughs> fucking strange <laughs> um but n- nothing that's really tickled me uh as a sort of like puzzle lover but it's a cool i mean if you take it as a chill out game it's a, it's a very satisfying to watch these just huge numbers of people um leap and pour in giant torrents of bodies through the various commands that you place yes it's fr- yes it's from the um the uh, Tetris Effect team, isn't it? Mm. Um, I, I forget his name, but the guy, um, the guy who did Res and then Tetris Effect and, and Lumens or Lumines, however you're supposed to pronounce that. So he's so good on music and polish and and sort of whiz bang um, visual design. I mean, I, I I played the demo, which was a pretty substantive demo. I got to see the lightsabers, and uh, I was I was really impressed with it. I thought the, the puzzles to me were the kind of um, the right kind of degree of of kind of where I like to be with puzzles, where you try something and the game goes, ah, yeah, good try. <laughs> now do that again slightly differently, because that is about as much as I can cope with um, in a puzzle <laughs> game. It's just like, mm, yeah, well done. Do that, but one step step over from there as well. Um, I kind of wonder if the, the demo is maybe a better experience than the the, the actual game, because it feels it's taking a, it takes a long time for it to escalate in interesting ways. Whereas it sounds like the the demo must have been quite a compressed experience. If you got to the lightsabers already uh, in a demo, that's uh, yeah, the, you skipped a lot of filler. <laughs> the demo was the demo was a real treat to play, definitely, ah. and and it had a kind of um, you know coming soon on uh, trailer at the end of it, which was also really exciting. So this was one I was definitely intending um, to play. I like that it draws on that mad um, intelligent cube game that came on the PS One, the disc you got with a PlayStation One. 
Um, I don't know if you're, you're familiar with that game. No, I don't uh, think so. It, oh, it's, well, it's, it's, you'll see if you ever see footage of it. It's very, very similar in that you're a little man running around on a kind of map of, of blocks which are kind of folding in on you uh, uh, and in with kind of loud slamming noises. And it was kind of this completely mad, completely weird, faintly existentially terrifying game that came with the uh, <laughs> PS1. Uh, which, which uh, yeah, that game, the game you're describing, which I want to call Humanity, is that right? The, the one I'm currently playing, yes. Yes, yes, because there's another game called mm. Humankind, which my brain has oh, decided is yes, the same that's a, game. That's a very different, very and different. much worse game. <laughs> 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 yeah, that game should could probably be improved by a dog barking at people to hurry them along a little bit. Oh, for sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How do you feel about the uh, being the dog in it? I think it's kind of brilliant. Is what is was my feelings of it. It's kind of it just felt really singular and unusual. Like the idea that you're this dog leading humanity to its like final rapture is like an idea that's so stupid that it kind of comes out the other side for me. Like, I can imagine playing, you know, because, you know, I think the game does some, like, narrative stuff as it goes further along, or at least the trailer, the demo yeah. seems to suggest that. And I don't know, I I, I kind of... It see, the dog's animated in such a kind of unusual um, way that it just kind of... I don't know, I, I kind of felt quite connected to it when I played it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't quite know... I think it just makes such an impact visually that game yeah. that like maybe in a whole game it's 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 that kind of wears thin a little bit um if you're slogging through puzzles which aren't particularly um mm. impressive but like the first like sight of that game is a real knockout I think and maybe it it sort of struggles to recover from that well I suppose what I meant is that the unlike lemmings where you are a mouse pointer uh, looking at a, a level, and you can you know do whatever you like in any parts of that level. Is that right? Can you? I'm not sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, yeah, so you can click, you, lemmings. <laughs> the lemmings. You have to get the lemmings there, and then you can click on them to do that. Right. Thing. Yeah. Um, but you you aren't embodied in any way. Is is the, is the thing I'm getting getting to? No. Whereas in this game, you, your severe of influence is completely curtailed by where you are as a dog and where you can get to as a dog. Um, and I think that that. I think it has some really good good effects and some uh, less good effects. The the good effect is that it makes your interaction with that environment very tactile and immediate, and it's sort of unlike a lot of puzzle games where you could just sit back and you know watch things unravel and click away from your vaunted position as demigod player. It sort of keeps you wrapped and uh in the action and sort of enlivens your attention to the kind of events of the puzzle um um and it doesn't matter that unusually unlike in lemmings it doesn't matter that uh people you're herding plunged their deaths uh in large numbers you can't ever exhaust the supply of people so your immediacy isn't often kind of isn't isn't part of the challenge most of the time however um, there are points where you do need to sort of act fast in real time because throughout the level there are these um, giant golden people just in little positions around the level who you must direct your column to and collect as it winds its circuitous route towards the goal, um, which is usually a, a glowing beam of light that yoinks the masses up into the sky. But if you lose one of the goldies, as they're called, that's it. That was your only chance unless you restart the level uh, you can you can continue to complete the level without the goldies. They're just like extra stars on your completed stats. So I mean, obviously you, you you're you're incentivized to get them for a the sake of completion. Um, and I like I like that in theory because the idea is that whilst it is this kind of meditative game and there is very low stakes for failure, adding these optional things in, which mean that. You have to react quickly because they're often at the head of your column and you can't necessarily get to places uh, in advance of the column to place your instructions for them um, in advance. So you need to be there with the, the, the kind of vanguard of your column um, as they're reaching the hazards in order to place the things directly in front of them at the last second sometimes. Um, and that sort of shakes you out of any kind of sense of complacency that you might have had about solving the puzzle. Uh, and it makes you sure you've, you've planned ahead as much as you can um, but then when, I don't know, there's a point at which this sort of breaks down for me and it seems like it breaks down for me reliably stage after stage, which is that parts 
often the very later parts of the level are inaccessible to you initially. So you have to wait for your column to get there or you need to wait for people to stand on pressure switches before you can actually navigate the geometry to get there yourself. And then in that sort of last second scramble to drop the correct instructions as your column approaches, like the, the later hazards of a level, you might lose a Goldie um, simply because you haven't got there in time because you've been a bit slow or you're not quite sure how an instruction will play out. You might have like, because you can't actually eyeball instantaneously how far the, the people will jump when asked to jump. So you, you know, you, you placed it down on the wrong tile and then you've lost a Goldie and you just have to start again, but you have, you start again with all of the commands you've already placed in the level, which means often what you're doing for like a minute or more is just holding down the fast forward button until the column reaches the point where your bad command was, and then you move it by one tile. <laughs> and then <laughs> it's it's like, good job, well, you fixed it. And I don't know, it just it feels like that's quite an unsatisfying loop. Um, I, know, I guess that was true of Lemmings as well, to some extent, because there was a lot of trial and error and waiting to see how things play out. But I don't know, I guess it feels incongruous here because there's so much of the level that plays out without hazard. And then there's this like final 10%, which you might have to restart a couple of times and fast forward to each time. It just, it, it, I found that kind of irritating. It's funny, isn't it? Because all of their previous games have all been about like trying to sort of induce a sort of um, late 90s utopian uh, dance culture, uh, urban Welsh novel after train spotting state of kind of flow and connection with music. And, um, mostly success, successful in that right like res puts you on a kind of you know flying through an abstract void of of kind of uh you know mad computer shit uh lumens luminand and i don't know how to pronounce that game uh is a kind of you know tetris like but with a much like simpler structure to it in many ways and then tetris effect is this kind of you, you know you're playing tetris everyone knows how to play tetris and so the game can fire all these flashbang amazing visuals at you safe in the knowledge that everyone knows how to play tetris so like they've had that kind of flow state built into them from the very start of of their games and they do it incredibly well and it's funny that with this game which is a a real time puzzle game you know that 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 what they do best kind of isn't necessarily represented in there like it's not a game about flow states or rather it is but the kind of different kind of flow state where you're sort of perfecting mm. a system um and that's you know that's that's unusual and like the the kind of visual polish and the visual style is all very impressive but it does seem like it doesn't have that connection sort of between the hands and the heads and the the visuals that they've done so well before maybe yeah i'm not i'm not that intrigued to carry on playing it like uh i looked at some videos of some later levels uh, just to just to see if it goes anywhere interesting, and certainly like the the amount of ordering of instructions you have to put down increases vastly, and there are exciting things with conveyor belts and pushable blocks and stuff. But I don't feel like anything I've seen feels m magical. Like that, superficially, it looks amazing. Like, and that's the tr true of everything in this game is it, it wows you continuously, but with its its style and, and uh, just the the odd panache of its execution. But um, if, if you sort of try and read what it's doing in terms of like just raw puzzle mechanics, I don't know that there's a lot to, to get your teeth into, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I, I'm prejudging it. Well, I saw that there's like going to be a, like a community mode in it as well, where people can make their their own puzzles and stuff like that and that's always that can always be an intriguing space i used to love dicking around with you know the n the uh, ninja game n and n plus plus and its various mutations and antecedents and like you know the community content for that was always spectacularly good fun and, and really well you know just a bunch of really creative stuff with this relatively narrow tool set so sometimes those things can be quite cool hmm. um although also they can often just be empty and crap so <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean playing jamie so I've been playing. Um, I've I've stopped playing Tears of the Kingdom now. Um, not for oh. good. <laughs> not for good. Not forever. I I you know that that thing happened that happens on Nintendo Switch where it will say like um, if you look at your profile it's say like, you first start played you first played this game four days ago you first played this game five days ago 
And then eventually it'll tell you how many hours you played your game for after about a week or so. You get your sort of reveal. You get your review back from Nintendo to tell you how sad and lifeless you are. And uh, I got my review in and I played 50 hours in a little over a week, which is a lot, um, considering I have two children. <laughs> um, somehow, <laughs> somehow I'd managed to do that. Um, and the game is still an absolute marvel. Um, the game has remained a marvel through all of that time. But it is very, very, very big, and there is lots to do. And you know, kind of looking at your list of side quests and the the sort of things on the map that need doing. And you, I did find myself feeling a bit of the Ubisoft, um, Ubisoft uh, nightmare anxiety <laughs> of uh, a big checklist I had to get through, which is interesting because that's what people always compare. Um, uh, you know unfavorably compare Ubisoft games to uh, uh, Breath of the Wild, you know, by saying that, like, it's not just a checklist, it's not just a kind of collect-a-thon. And uh, after a certain point, um, Tears of the Kingdom can absolutely resemble a -a collect-a-thon, a a map-ticking, you know, Hmm. thingamabob. Um, uh, Your map can literally be covered in icons and and things that you need to explore. Um, So I kind of was becoming a bit more aware of that than I had been. Um, despite the continuing moments of joy and magic that that game seems to summon from nothing, uh, time and time over, I decided I was getting a little bit fatigued by it. So I, I popped it down for a little while and uh, I picked up something completely different, which I'm really delighted I did. So this is the game uh, Sifu. I think that's how you pronounce it, Sifu, mm. um, which is this uh, kung fu fighting game. I think uh, you and uh, Tom S talked about it briefly on a on a previous pod. Um, but yeah, it's this really brilliant, really unusual um, kung fu fighting game where you play a. Um, I'm playing as a girl. You play as a young woman whose father, I think, in the in the tutorial prologue, is murdered by a gang of nasty uh, villains. And through the credits, you're sort of training up to avenge him. And then the game starts, and there are, I think, five levels to work through. Um, the structure of it is is really unusual. I'll try and explain it best I can. But essentially, um, you every time you die, your age increases um, based on uh, how many. Uh, <laughs> this is such a common, it's it's hard to explain. But actually, in when you're playing it, it's not too bad. You can when you die, your age increases by a certain number of ye- years based on how well or badly you're doing in a given level. So you can sort of mediate that number. So sometimes you'll die and your age will increase by one year. Sometimes you'll die and your age will increase by like four or five years. Every You start off as 20 and every 10 years um, you lose a sort of one of your sort of um, symbols on your medallion uh, sort of explodes and that's a kind of proper life, a life lost. And once you get above the age of 70 and die, that's game over. So you essentially get... I think it's um, you get a finite number of lives, basically depending on how you're doing in a, in a level. Um, but once you get above the age of seventy, uh, you're dead for good, and you have to start again. The older you get, the more powerful your punches are, but the more flimsy your body is, just like in real life. And <laughs> you, <laughs> once you you're, you're basically aiming to complete the levels at a younger at the youngest age you can, um, in order to start the next level at that same age. Um, so like the first time I completed level one, I was like 64 or something. Um, but obviously I wanted to get it down to 20, basically no death run of level one. So I could play level two, um, starting at the age of 20. The game's very good at remembering what your best score was at the beginning of any level. So that every time you play one of the levels, you go back to it basically at the level you would, you're doing best at the first time you arrive there. Um, it sort of sounds complicated, and it is complicated for the first sort of hour or so of play. You're kind of like, hang on, what am I doing? Like, <laughs> there's got a real vibe of that to the structure. <laughs> it's really hard to understand. And the game really needs a kind of explain it like I'm five pop up in the menu to kind of explain what's going on. But once you get into the swing of it, um, you realize that the difficulty curve is actually quite forgiving as long as you're happy playing through the levels again and again and again to kind of level up your skills and stuff like that. And it's no problem playing through the levels again and again because they're an absolute joy to play through um, uh, for a few reasons. One, um, visually and stylish and stylistically, the game is 
really pleasant to look at. Um, you know, the levels start off as kind of pretty standard warehouse sort of kung fu locales that you're sort of fighting your way through. But then in the, the later stages of the game, I've just got to level three, which is a museum, which is just this absolute marvel of, of kind of design. And, and, and like the closing moments of that level feel like the final boss of another game. It's like, it's so creative and um, unusual. And you just feel like you're playing through this really epic story. Um, so visually it's, and, and the characters are, are designed like with a kind of level of sort of simplicity and detail, which is always the sort of thing I respond to you know they feel very um tactile and real while still being kind of you know they have a kind of cell shaded um look to them and you know your character might the, the girl i'm playing as as she ages up you know they, they they're very clever with how they they kind of you know have continuity from the person you start with to the aged figure sort of trying to trying their best to take down the boss at the end of the level the other reason it's deeply playable and replayable is the combat is just great. I like. I would like to say that I'm the kind of guy who could re- reference the particular kung fu movies, that obscure kung fu movies that this would remind me of, but I can't. I don't know anything about that sort of thing. But you, you do feel like you are playing through a really cool scene in a really cool kung fu movie. The, the combat and the blocking and the parrying system, it takes some time to master, but not too long to, like really be having fun so you're sort of parrying people you're blocking you're pushing people away you're picking up pipes and hitting people over the head with them you're you you realize you're often taking on groups of like 10 people at once and you realize that like that the fight is is less about like quick reflexes and is more about like space management all right so i'm going to grab this guy i can hit him with a hard punch that means he'll stagger and i can throw him forward and he'll Um, crash into that other person and that will buy me the moment I need to kick this chair on the floor and that will hit that guy in the face um, to give me time to kick the shit out of this one person over here. Um, And the game has just a brilliant rhythm and a sort of sense of kinetic joy to it, which I was just so impressed by. And it's just so compulsive to play um, because it's just, it's basically Streets of Rage, right? And it's, it's relatively simple, but 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 uh but kind of joyful in that. So yeah, I've just been having a great time with that game. Um I think difficulty curve on the on the sort of standard difficulty I'm playing is so far at least really satisfying. So like the first time I fought the first boss I, was, I had that moment of like oh I literally have no idea how I'm going to beat this guy and then <laughs> the, the third or fourth time I did it without getting hit almost at all. Um same with the second boss. I've just got to the boss of the third level who is literally like wholesale lifted from Kill Bill, one of the <laughs> one of the fights in Kill Bill, and I didn't punch her, didn't hit her even once. So I have no idea how I'm gonna <laughs> how I'm gonna best her. Um, and also, I haven't got to her at an age kind of appropriate enough to kick her head in yet. So I'm gonna have to sort of master the preceding level a bit more before I can do that. Um, but it has a it has a really bold and ambitious structure that is quite forbidding when you start playing but I actually think is a roaring success. It kind of takes elements of of kind of arcade games and roguelike games, as well as like more AAA sort of cinematic experiences, and I think really confidently um, presents them in in a way that feels genuinely unusual. I had to um, uh, steal a save file off off the internet because I... um, uh, my, uh, I lost my save file through complicated Steam Deck shenanigans reasons. And so there was someone who put their save file online. So I'm borrowing that to kind of uh, start a new play on where I've got all my skills unlocked. And I had a look at the kind of fully uh, 100%ed game. And there's tons of like, I can see there's tons of post-game content there and modifiers you can add to your runs and a, hmm. a new reward system that unlocks at the end. Like there's tons and tons of content in this game, despite there being only five levels that you can play through, I guess, in, you know, I'm sure there's people online playing through the entirety of the game in 15 minutes or whatever. Um, but yeah, are just, there, it's are just... there easy modes to it? Because oh, that yeah. would seem to be an- antithetical in some ways to the, the, the structure of it. They added one. So they added an easy mode um, relatively recently in a, in a DLC they put out. Um, and there is also a hard mode. 
And then, yes, there are modifiers as well. Um, So it looks like they sort of started off with that kind of attitude of this is just the experience that we that we want to give people and, you know, take it or leave it. And I remember some of the earlier reviews of the game and some of the chat on the Crate and Crowbar Discord sort of saying, you know, being on kind of both sides of that issue, being like, I love this game because you have to basically come to the party with it. And mm. if you don't want, if you don't do that, then, then, you know, it's not for you, but if you're yeah, willing to buy right. into it, it's really special. Um, but I think they sort of moderated away from that a little bit more now and said, and there's a difficulty option at the beginning, which is like, you know, if you want to just have fun and, and have an experience of story, there's this mode. I am not good at twitchy games. Like I got, I just about got through Sekiro um, but it took me <laughs> three or four times longer than just about anyone else. Um, and the difficulty of the of, of, of Sifu so far feels just right to me. I'm still having fun, you know. Oh, right. um, so yeah, I think it's I think it's a, a bit of a bit of a classic to be honest. Their their previous game, Absolver, which I remember Chris talking about on mm. Crank Crowbar years ago, was like a really like deep kung fu simulation thing. Very had a kind of open world to it. Had a kind of Dark Souls element to it it was really um uh it was really uh, uh unusual um and it feels like they've gone for much more of a kind of mainstream uh kind of vibe here but it's still yeah it's still unusual it's still there's still nothing else quite like it out there um and i think the next game they make is going to be really something um this almost feels like an audition for like for them to make the next uncharted or or uh, or um, uh, the, the 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 angry god man, uh, uh, God of War. <laughs> <laughs> right. They should have called it angry. That would have been man, a better but, name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. angry god dad. Uh, yeah, it, it could almost be like if I was a big, you know, Sony like company, and I was looking for people to kind of make the next Uncharted or you know something like that. I would be looking at studios like this because they're clear, cr- clearly supremely confident in. In, in what they what they like and what they mm. want to present in a game. So, yeah, I've been loving it. These games which sort of um, allow you to embody a cinematic style, particularly a, a cinematic, you know, combat style, I always find, like, very endearing when it's going well. <laughs> but then um, it, it, the whole illusion of that, for me, then instantly shatters the second that, I flub it. And obviously that's that's a completely legitimate punishment that ultimately this stops looking like uh, uh, a film that you are propelling through your action and and becomes just a you know an, a, a graceless fuck fest. Um, <laughs> but nonetheless I, f- I find myself often ag- aggrieved in these sorts of games because there's there's not the kind of elasticity to maintain the fantasy through my failures <laughs> and obviously the, the answer to that is that I replace myself and get somebody better to play it <laughs> but um uh, that sort of yeah that, that can't work for me in some ways does this does this game allow you to call, kind of carry on the the beautiful suggestion of cinema that it's presenting even when you fail Yes, I'd say it does actually, because the amount of times that you can fail in a level is pretty generous. You know, you can die a lot. And the aging mechanic, um, you know, I don't quite understand the in-universe reason for that, but it does moderate against that sense of like, oh, well, I was being John Wick then, but now I'm just Mr. Blobby. (laughs) You know, it's like, I just kind of, all my fun's been taken off me because... You you rise straight up from being knocked down, older <laughs> but stronger, um, and for some reason um, that combined with like that you're always unlocking things, kind of as you go. Every fight, every single person you beat is unlocking new skills for you. I actually think it it does a really good job of stopping that feeling of your inertia being, uh, your momentum being broken, um, because you can pretty much get through the level to the boss and even beat them. You might not do it at the optimum age, and that might be you know, what you need to go back and do and get better at. But one thing I like about the game is that it doesn't withhold its content from you. And by content, I don't just mean it's like, like impressive visual assets, but it's like its core experience. Um, the museum level I just got to is a complete palette change from anything you've seen before. All the enemies are different. Um, you know, I got through to the final boss on my first go of it. Um, I imagine most people would probably be able to, um, but the last boss completely wiped the floor with me. Um, but the experience I'd had before that of basically 
you know, kicking a bunch of people's heads in while I ran through this plush art gallery was just the sense of momentum and exhilaration was pretty unbreakable, even though I was being knocked down many, many times. I think it builds in an in-universe reason for you to be beaten um, so that you don't have that sense of confidence broken. You actually, it just it just um, drives you to, to, to get better at the game whilst supporting you through that process as well. So I think it's quite special in that sense because I am also someone who, you know, struggles a bit when my shitness is pointed out to me for the fourth time <laughs> in a row, um, you know. And well, I'm just I, th- I, think like, it's, well, I think it's maybe because the way the games express failure doesn't have the same uh, kind of uh, cinematic uh, cogency. Like, for example, if a protagonist gets absolutely mullered in a film, like that will still be shot well. <laughs> yeah. Whereas, you know, as uh, as Kyle Kestis, when I when I accidentally select the wrong person to attack, and then Cal kind of flails partly off screen, it just looks rubbish. You know, that wouldn't happen in cinema. The entire kind of fiction of it suddenly suddenly breaks quite down. Quite good, wouldn't it? If like someone shot Bruce Wayne and like uh, not Bruce Wayne, uh, Bruce Willis in in Die Hard, and he just sort of ragdolled and clipped through the wall. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. No. I think, as I say, I think it. I think it does a. I think it manages to preserve that sense of cinema past the hmm. point of failure. That's to cool. a pretty. To a pretty. To the degree, I think they thought long and hard about how to how to achieve that. Yeah. If if it can make me look good, even at my most graceless and pathetic, then uh, then I will take it for sure. I mean, there's a bit of me that's thinking like maybe maybe that maybe this game supports that really well, or maybe I'm just really hot shit at fighting. <laughs> like maybe that. I would believe it, Jamie. Here. I am just an absolute badass motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> no contention here. It's definitely this, obviously this, true. This game has got to come to my level. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been playing a weird game with a weird name? I have, yes. Uh, Veiled Experts. Um, I, I just when you said that title to me earlier, I cannot fit it in my head. I just can't <laughs> accept that there is a game with that title uh, in uh, existence. It makes, like I said, it, you know, it makes more sense when you imagine that it's the result of the Korean developers using Google Translate on secret agents to get it into Korean and then back into English again. Um, veiled experts is just yeah, it's just ripped <laughs> from a thesaurus, isn't it? <laughs> it's wonderful, uh, I, but it is so mad. <laughs> but it's it's very good. It's a it's a. I think it's very good anyway. I'm not really entirely sure, but I think it's good. It's a free to play um, Counter Strike style game, but with third person, um, which also adds sort of like hero shooter elements to it as well. Um, my 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 reticence to call it good immediately uh, is based on the fact that I'm I'm somewhat out of the loop with this style of shooter. Uh, I haven't played Valorant, and uh, although I, I have played a lot of Counter Strike in the past, I've I've hung up my Counter Strike hat some years ago because of my appalling atrophying skills. Um, and you know, I probably missed the hat stand completely and, and fell over while doing so. Um, <laughs> And then hurt my back. Um, there's also there's also quite a lot of stuff about it that looks a bit suspect. Like it's, I mean, it's obviously free to play. Like I said, uh, which is you know alarm bells there always. Um, uh, and it has it just has more features that would normally neatly fit on on top of something like Counter Strike, which is you know uh, famously a, a really kind of pared down uh, bomb setting, bomb defusal. Uh, game at its core, where the the skill ceiling is is um, free of any distractions, which I was never able to compete at at a high level. But in any case, like the more stuff you ladle upon that sort of core, the greater risk is that you'll lose the sort of actual game in all that noise. Um, and I, like to some extent, I'm more okay with that now, partly because I am so shit <laughs> playing games. Um, that it has uh, that like having loads of ancillary systems that sort of ameliorate the necessity for raw skill or model it up are actually more attractive to me now, even if it ends up being more arbitrary as a result. Uh, and like obviously, I, I don't want to play something that feels like egregiously unbalanced or has loads of exploits in it. And I think that's possibly a risk here. I'm, I don't quite have a enough of a grasp on it to know whether that's the case but I, I sort of don't mind a certain amount of fudginess 
to my shooters because I simply can't play them <laughs> to be good at them anyway <laughs> in a competitive sense. Um, but that that being said, I actually think the Veiled Experts, to the degree that I'm able to parse this stuff, because there's a lot of stuff going on in this game, um, and I haven't played it that extensively, but I feel like the stuff I've seen of it is pretty thoughtful. So there's like a, there's a massive, massive roster of characters who each have their own skills, um, but none of them are like crazily dramatic. Like the character I have, uh, you know, her main ability is that she can eat a hot dog. Uh, which uh, lets her regen a small amount of health across time. That's quite incongruous, incidentally. This is a very serious-looking game with you know, <laughs> lots of sort of James Bond-adjacent kind of cool characters, but her ability is to eat a hot dog. Um, and and a lot of a lot of the the kind of special abilities that people have, they take on the same roles, more or less, that can be filled by uh, items that you can also purchase between rounds. Um, and you can also equip like character agnostic powers, uh, which are called inexplicably leptons. Um, <laughs> but um, again, none of that is, none of that is like wildly powerful. It's just stuff like um, you get a, like a free shotgun in round two, um, which actually, well, uh, well, I mean, that might seem significant to a Counter-Strike player, but the, but the, the sort of round-based economy in in Veiled Experts is super forgiving. Like we we got absolutely hammered <laughs> in a lot of the games <laughs> that we played, and yet I was never short of cash to buy stuff. And uh, and even if you die, you actually keep all your uh, weapons from the previous rounds. Um, so it, really, a, a free shotgun doesn't do that much more than save you having to click a button uh, in round two. But it but it feels like all of this stuff is more about building and supporting existing play styles rather than uh, giving characters incredibly divergent and dis and and uh, excessive powers like in the same way that, like like overwatch's hero abilities there's not there's not really anything of that scale here but I, I quite like that I think it, it mean it sort of takes the edge off uh, a lot of the the free to play grind as well because although you might want to un unlock these different characters who have slight biases to their skills the the degree of difference between them isn't so great that you feel that you're missing out on, on any of that stuff um uh and the other thing is that it's for a large part uh unlike counter-strike or a lot of similar games of of this style it's a third person game um and i i, I can imagine a lot of people who are super into counter-strike uh, would would immediately think that was stupid uh, because that would reduce your ability to kind of you know twitch aim and click on people's heads, and it absolutely does, and that is the correct thing <laughs> for this game. Um, you can you sort of uh, you press a button to go into over the shoulder aim, and you can click it again to go into first person iron sights, and that just the, the the sluggishness of that is perfectly tuned i think because uh and it, it, the degree to which it changes your accuracy and the sloth of actually enacting that makes this a much much more methodical game about positioning and teamwork than it is about twitch skills and it, it actually reminds me of like a, a slightly speedier version of gears of wars multiplayer which I was really good at actually, uh, un unlikely that that, that that sounds. <laughs> Perhaps be precisely because it wasn't about Twitch girls, but it was more about like some element of strategy in, in thinking about how you'll pr pressure and and flank, and it was about positional awareness more than just clicking on on heads. Um, and that's true here. And you just aren't you aren't really going to do much harm to anybody by spraying at them, um, even if you're even if your reticle is directly over them, you know, it's, it's, uh, especially if they're in motion because they can roll and evade as well. Uh, and in general, it takes, even if, 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 even if you have them dead to rights, you know, um, it takes longer to put somebody down in this than it does in Counter-Strike. Not like hugely so, it's not like halo levels of chip damage, but it's, um, it is just that tiny bit slower such that you have to be much more uh, intentional and methodical and use teamwork as well. Positional awareness is really key in this. You have loads and loads of different tools which scan the environment and give away the position of enemies. Um, and that's just super, super important. Um, I think maybe as a new player, uh, the, the maps are, are, are very complicated to learn um, and they, they change across subsequent rounds as well. Like there's a, 
one of the levels we're playing, a helicopter f- crashes into a building and it opens up like entirely new routes. Uh, I, I'm not quite sure if that happens like every time you play, whether that's that's random. Um, but uh, on top of that, there's a sort of a, a sort of death zone, like like you get in battle royale games. But it isn't like a, a shrinking ring um, to focus the ac- action on a single point, like you know, like a Last Man Standing sort of game. It's this sort of irregular polygon that changes shape and just sort of eats up different parts of the map's periphery. Uh, also, like sweeps in and pushes the the kind of the play to to one channel almost within the level, and then retracts again mid round. And I, I, like I, this. At first, I thought this was, along with a lot of the other sort of inventions for this game, kind of extraneous. It's kind of like too many things put on top of quite a simple game. But but actually, I think it may be just very cleverly designed because <laughs> uh, it sort of denies repeated use of particular camping spots. And I don't know if it's reactive based on player behavior, but it felt that way. Or at least yeah. it felt like the result of it was that it forced you mid-round to adopt very different strategies. You couldn't just keep on doing the same thing over and over again. And if, if you know you of a team have got something down pat, like you know how to dominate a certain area of the map, that's not going to be true in later rounds. You're going to have be forced to improvise. Um, and all of this sort of creates the the fudginess that I like. It, it kind of evens the playing field to some degree because it, it 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 forces people out of their comfort zone. Um, I haven't really played enough to say whether that that means that there are lots of balance problems. Um, there are certainly some very characterful levels, I would say, that are designed, <laughs> um, like even taking away the dynamic amounts. So there's like, there's one map which is set, um, oh God, I don't even know how to explain this. It, seem, it seems initially like it's set in a, like this gently hillocked cornfield uh, with a tractor and a barn in the center. But like outside of that, beyond the kind of the immediate play area, all the fields and the horizon are, in fact, uh, just displayed on giant sort of like fritz, fritzing LCD panels. So it's like <laughs> a, a completely simulated environment with just like this, the geometry in the center has been placed there for the purposes of this battle. It's cool. I, like, I, I don't know. I, I just feel like all of the environments have some kind of weird little twist to them like that. But but the other thing about this environment, it's like it it's so extreme in that it, the way it dictates play because there's really like it's it's like gently sloping away uh, from the center point and the only and the only point that gives you any kind of oversight of the terrain is the barn roof and so like you know everything centers on dominating that roof basically and and it kind of changes whereas all of the other levels feel like there's there's lots of things going on it's just that this is the map in which you know it's, it's the roof barn roof map you know um <laughs> And I don't know if that jibes that well with the sort of game that Veiled Experts b- presents to be, um, or whether it just sort of turns turns it into kind of knockabout nonsense. I don't know yet, but like I'm, I've seen enough really surprisingly clever design in Veiled Experts that I'm kind of willing to give it the, the benefit of the doubt. Um, I enjoyed it a lot, and I shall play it some more, time zones permitting. <laughs> it sounds fascinating. Like... You know, I'm I'm never going to be good at a, a, an online shooter in in terms of, of twitchiness and accuracy. I just it's just never going to happen. But I do enjoy playing those games, and I think yeah, there's been a bit more of a push recently to kind of moderate against the idea of perfect play and and try and let more people have fun with these things. Which is, I mean, I think Overwatch was initially an attempt at that, but then it just immediately got bogged down into like, uh, um, you know everyone kind of uh, perfecting their their meta game whatever mm. um but it's why i like um hunt showdown you know because mm. hunt showdown offers you kind of a, a battle royale kind of chaos but with kind of nice gaps for just hanging around and chatting and uh, and sort of wandering around um and i actually think apex legends was a fair attempt on that as well like oh, yeah. i still i still play that every now and again because i think for me the fun of a battle royale type game and also the fun of a kind of counter-strike type game is never going to be in the winning really it's in kind of in being involved in something that's kind of big and chaotic and out of control that's always been the fun for me and i love it in apex legends where 
you know, uh, two or three teams converge on each other and it's just a complete, you know, fucking nightmare. Everyone's running around and you're chasing each other and shooting each other. And, and that's always been the joy in those games for me rather than the, rather than the winning. Um, and yeah, it just sounds like a, a game like this, that attempt to kind of push people away from playing perfectly and try and have a bit more of a dynamic sense of things sounds um, sounds really fun. It's also the reason I love like chivalry too, um, because like you can have a lot of fun even if you're crap at chivalry too, because you can just go around like cutting people's heads off when they're not looking, and the game supports that, uh, and you can have a lot of fun doing that without having to be like you know overlord uh, killer master type person um so yeah i think um this game sounds interesting uh in that in that space because i think once these things get up and running they can be uh, really fun in a kind of um unreal tournament kind of vibe to them um mm. you know a kind of yeah uh, so yeah it sounds good I think my cat's going to try and be sick in a second, so I might... <laughs> That's okay. We can, um, we can call it a night. All right. Well, in that case, I think that's actually the entire podcast that we have time for this evening. Um, if you would like to send us a question, you can do so by sending a question to questions at crowbar.com. You can tweet us at Crate and Crowbar. You can see these recordings uploaded as videos to YouTube, where you can find other stuff by us. The address for that is youtube.com slash Crate and Crowbar. Thanks, as always, to our backers and Patreon. You can back us too at patreon.com slash crowbar, or you can just join our lovely Discord community, link for which is on our website, crateandcrowbar.com. That's it. I've been Marsh Davis. I've been Jamie Britton. Fare thee well. Night-night.